original Star Trek series. And uh, Roddenberry, uh, uh, one of the things that I loved about the Star, the Star Trek, um, the Star Trek sort of conception was that it was it was an opportunity that um, that Roddenberry afforded himself to uh, to uh, make social commentary. And so this particular episode was about uh, was about racism, which um, you had to sort of deal with um, uh, very delicately. Out, you know, if you, if you were doing a, con a contemporary narrative, but because it's the future and all these problems were solved in in um, in the uh, 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 in at least within the Federation, uh, they could uh, they could really sort of put. Um, uh, Focus in on that. Well, what I did was I recontextualized uh, the um, uh, the narrative, or I mean the um, uh, yeah, I recontextualized it in the uh, the uh, struggle for uh, for gay rights, in, uh, especially in the 2000s. This was this painting was done in 2005, and um, Beale is a. Uh, I don't know if you got the race thing, but Beale is um, is. He's on the left, and he's white on the left side, and Lokai is uh, is white on the right side, and um, uh, and they're they're saying I love you. So. <laughs> uh, oh, and then the knots. The knots are all um, they're that's a knot board that like a Boy Scout would um, would would make and get you know the knot the knot tying merit badge for it, uh, which I think I got I got that one. Uh, but anyways, I renamed the knots after after philosophers and science fiction writers, and one's named after Gene Roddenberry. I think it's called the Roddenberry Hitch. Uh, it's right at the bottom there. But um, but they're um, so they're renamed after philosophers and science fiction writers and, and and other figures who had a really optimistic vision about about um, uh, uh, about the human future, you know, that's just sort of what, how we're going to solve all these problems. And Hegel's in there, and Karl Marx is in there, and uh, Ursula Le Guin is in there. So it's a kind of a, a mishmash of different people that have been, that kind of inspired me. And um, not, I'm not a Marxist. So. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so, so, what I, so the way I think about my work is that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mining our popular culture and, and creating allegories that use something that already has some uh, some uh, 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 some meaning at, uh, that has been um, uh, that has been sort of written into it by uh, its original context, and I am uh, using that uh, in juxtaposition with other elements uh, to uh, uh, to create a new element. Uh, and to speak about um, things that are happening right now, in, uh, or happened in 2005. <laughs> but it is—it just—it's really—it's uh, the timing is perfect because it, uh, um, because the Supreme Court just decided on uh, on uh, legalizing gay marriage. So um, I feel like uh, yeah, I'm vindicated in the thing. But anyways, um, yeah. So that's how it works. I I sometimes call it I sometimes call it postmodern allegory and. And so I feel, even though I'm not, I'm not in, I'm, I'm not working as an illustrator, and not working as a um, uh, in in comics or graphic novels. I, uh, I've I've been influenced very much by, um, for example, the Hildebrandt Brothers when I was a kid. Oh my God! I when when I um, when I snuck into my sister's bedroom and found the Hildebrandt. Uh, the, the J.R.R. Tolkien calendar from like 1975, and, and, and the color, it was like, it was like, uh, and I didn't know Poussin at the time, but it was like Poussin, like on, uh, um, uh, with a lot of, uh, with a heavy dose of like high fructose corn syrup, or something, you know? and because uh, the color was just super intensified, and uh, and also it was it was Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones in some ways, so I was uh, I was totally into it and. Uh, and that 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 really got me into making narrative paintings, fantasy imagery, and uh, and and they tried to beat that out of me when I went to college, and then I, I finally pulled it back together again once I got out of school. Um, 
but I never, I never went into the industry like my father was hoping I would do. Instead, I, I remained a fine artist. Uh, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, Laura. Can you talk a little bit about the composition, the way you set it up? It's, it's kind of like a Rorschach, right? Where it's been sandwiched and you open it and they're exact opposites, and there's this rift in the middle. So as much as you're joining them, you're really kind of dividing them as well. You know what I'm saying? Like there's this ocean in the middle. There's a central panel of wood, and then everything is kind of Pull it together and open back. Yeah. Everything's pulling out but, to the but side. But you know, the, the knotboard on the left is the same knotboard on the right. So the okay. so if you sever it down the middle, it reconnects on the other side. Right. You cut it so in you, there, can, you, you can just take it. The yeah. uh, you know, and I I could I could have done that. But I, yeah. <laughs> I could have made it a diptych, and then it would it would have been um, one of my one of my teachers, um, uh, James McGarrell. Well, he was kind of a teacher. Uh, uh, critiqued my work when I was in school. He, um, he does these things, he calls them verso variant diptychs and triptychs, where it's all, con it's a continuous scene that, um, like a MOBA strip, you can take one end of it and it connects with the other, and so it just, you can just rearrange it. Um, or, yeah, I guess. But, um, but each, you know, each frame is a different image, but they, but when you come to the edge, it, it, uh, it, it's, it lines up with the, the next band. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't know if I have anything to say about this. The you know the fact that the composition uh, divides them. They're, they represent two different um, races. The um, you know the the, um, the master race and the slave race, and they um, uh, and they they appear to have resolved things. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the wood grain is really common in this painting, and I know in more recent stuff, a lot of wood grain, and I've never asked you about that. You painted so beautifully. Like, what? I'm glad you asked that. I was actually thinking the same thing. Like, yeah. Where does, how does wood grain? Yeah. But this, let's see, this painting, yeah, this this was the painting that, uh, that, that made me fall in love with wood grain. Origin. Yeah, this is the origin. This is the origin. Yeah, and uh, I went to Home Depot. And they have they. I don't know if they still have this, but they, you know they have these books on different things you can do to make your house, you know, fancy. And uh, and there's like this faux. There was like a faux techniques book. So I grabbed the book, and there's a whole chapter devoted to faux wood grain. And I so I read the chapter, and because I, I wanted to know like how do you do faux wood grain? Because I wanted to do like dads. Den from the 1960s, <laughs> where with his his son, his Eagle Scout son's knot board, pri proudly hung there. And so, how do you do that kind of like, you know, what I don't know, it's fake. It, you know, it's some kind of print or something, or or sometimes it's actual wood, but it's it's really. Um, in, anyways, I I um, I figured it was kind of like a walnut, so I just tried to do like a faux walnut. Okay. Uh, and. Um, and, uh, and at least the color is, but maybe the grain is maybe more pine or something. But um, but anyways, there's like there's like some like six or seven steps of layering of color and wiping and texturizing and stuff. And I'm an indirect painter, so like you know, in, in the in the manner of the old masters of the Renaissance and Baroque, a layering color over color over color, all translucent and building the form that way. And um, and so as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. That's the kind of thing I do with a, with human flesh, but I, I never really did it with wood. And when I started doing it, I was like, oh my god, this is so much fun. Yeah, look at these gestures. I can just do wood grain like this. And then and then and then I create this other effect, and then I create this other effect. And uh, and I just had so much fun doing it. And I and the sort of the responsibility of making like serious, meaningful narrative figure narrative painting in the tradition of, you know, of, of Poussin uh, had, had somehow uh, uh, disappeared from my, you know, from uh, my, you know, these voices in my head. And so it was really kind of exciting and, and liberating. And so, uh, uh, and, then, and then I started seeing in my past all this wood everywhere. There was, um, my parents had a, had a pine cabin in, uh, uh, up in New Hampshire, where I spent all my summers, and uh, and and then uh, during the during the school year, I would build these p 
pine plywood um, uh, uh, clubhouses uh, in the woods next to our house. And, the, and we drag these uh, the plywood out of construction sites and put them together as best we could. And when we were bored with the design, we just like reconstructed a different way. And so, and so I, wood was a very important part of my environment, but I didn't quite, it wasn't on my radar screen until, uh, until I did this painting. And then, uh, uh, and, and now that's all I do. <laughs> it's, it's a boat wood grain. That's what I was doing this morning. And, that's what I was all day yesterday. and uh, I have one painting now that's got, uh, it looks like it's got about 200 individual pieces of wood that are faux grain. But they're not actual, it's not marketry, it's not real wood, it's all faux wood. Wow. Mm. So that just you also do uh, prints, right? The... Yeah, and so the print that was at, at the Sotheby's auction uh, yeah. uh, on Thursday, that. Um, some of the people standing around it were remarking that he's doing all this wood grain, but the wood grain is going in the opposite direction that he's carving the wood, the rendered wood grain. And so uh, they thought that was interesting. I, I, I have, that's what I have to do. I guess if I made it, if it was a lino cut, then there would be no grain, and then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be kind of ironic. But you know, so. Uh, yeah, Chris. John, can you talk about the construction of the figures, uh, like from the, from the earliest idea uh, time when you have the idea, and then do you do preliminary sketches? Do you have source material that you use? Uh, okay, so um, this is this is the old me. Okay, <laughs> when I would um, I would gather images. Uh, I'll pose for these, except for the hands. Uh, instead, I had. Um, I just use these these film stills from uh, mm -hmm. Star Trek uh, episodes um, and just spliced it together because there's no there's no pose exactly like this right. in in, uh, in there and so I had to kind of like make it up and I used myself to model the hands but um, but now now I build a 3D model in um, in the 3D modeling software called Maya and I use figures in Poser to a mannequin, they're basically mannequins, but they're far more detailed than, than like an artist mannequin. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and I, so I pose the figures, I, uh, and, then I, and then I import them into a Maya environment. Uh, and so I build it out as a three-dimensional space. And then I have somebody uh, pose for me for in that pose so I can get the empirical sort of you know, information. Mm -hmm. But what the, what the mannequin does is it gives me a real three-dimensional conception. So my, the dimensionality in my new work uh, for over the past maybe five years is far beyond the dimensionality of like of this one, mm -hmm. and you know it's like my 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 uh, my standards are a lot higher in terms of in terms of um, can, in terms of realism in terms of like verisimilitude. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Oh, so you talked about the uh, setting being dad's dad. What? Talking about setting being dad's den from like the sixties, were you thinking about it as a room where the TV airing Star Trek might actually be? So there's like, a, like yeah, they yeah. could be watching that. That's, that's, that's where Trek. when I was growing up, that's where the TV was. Yeah, yeah. there's a beanbag chair, like a, <laughs> yeah. like a not like a bright orange naga hide <laughs> uh, beanbag chair, and it's, you know, and there's a there's a green one too. And, 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 and the paneling of the TV. <laughs> I like so. how you caught the awkward stickiness of the, their fabrics, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the shirts that they wear on the show. Okay. Grabbing you in all the weird places. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, 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 they're not very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> the actor who played Lokai was a little a little heavier than that. Um, <laughs> so I think, I mean, I, 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 this is a more flattering version. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Well, thank you, John. Thank you.